evangelistic on us sometimes. I'm so used to saying tonight. John 4 and 23. If you'll go there, just give me a good amen when you're there. And bear with me. I'm going to change the batteries in this while you're fine. Praise the Lord. John 4 and 23. And we're going to read two verses, verses 23 and 24. And very familiar reading of Scripture. The setting is, we know that Jesus is sitting beside that woman at the well in Samaria. And this is what it says. This is, but the hour cometh and now he is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and and in truth. Can we read those two verses together? But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Today, this morning, I want to preach to you, and I know a few weeks ago on a Sunday night, I preached on a defense and Pentecostal expression Talking about worship. Well, today I want to talk to you for a few moments about true worship 101. You ever heard the term 101? It's kind of an introduction of a course or something. Well, today we're going to talk about true worship 101. How many knows that everybody that says that they worship God does not mean that they worship Him? Anybody know that? How many knows just because you lift your hands towards heaven doesn't mean that you're really worshiping Him? How many, needs, how many knows just because you come to church doesn't mean that you're worshiping God? Today, I want you to understand as we go into these verses of Scripture and some other verses as well, I want you to answer this question tonight. Do you worship God when you go to church? I'm asking you a question. You answer it yourself. Did you worship God this morning? Answer it yourself and your mind. Did you worship God this morning, even since we've been in the house of God? Now, this is what I want in your mind today as we're going to enter into this. My friend, we have to understand what worship is. You've got to focus in your mind to know this. Getting to church is it's more than just coming to church. When you're getting dressed in the morning, when you come into the church on the way here, you have to understand you can worship God anywhere. How many knows that? But how many knows that when you come together in the house of God corporately, there's something special about when you worship God and I worship God and she worships God and he worships God. When everybody worships God, something wonderful happens in His presence. So I'm asking you again, did you worship God this morning? Answer it to yourself. You've got to answer these questions and it must be something in your mind. What is a fact? Have you worshipped Him today or not? Have you ever asked yourself this question? And if you haven't, today I'm going to force you in these chapters to focus on this fact. If you worship God when you go to church or not. But how many knows that if you do not worship Him, that God is not pleased with that? He wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We must understand this today. My objective is to make you think today, first of all, about what worship is, second of all, whether you're doing it or not, and third of all, third third part of this message is going to be this, will you worship Him? So number one, follow me again, what is worship, or are you worshiping Him, or will you worship Him? That is what I want to establish today. So number one today, we must understand this, what is worship? And let me give you a definition. Worship is by definition honor paid to a superior being. It means giving honor. It means giving honor and reverence and respect and adoration and praise or glory to a superior being. Now, we must understand this. That is the idea in the context that when you come to church, that your vision of God is in His right perspective. It doesn't mean you're coming to church to worship somebody that is on the same level as you. It doesn't mean you're coming to church to worship a choir. It does not mean you're coming to church to worship a preacher. It does not mean you're coming to church to worship an instrument. It means that when you come to church, it is up to you as an individual to enter into a to an atmosphere, into a mindset that you are underneath the presence of the Almighty God. That's why the glory of God in the Bible is described to us as something that is 
weighty. It is something that is felt, my friends. Have you ever been underneath the influence or around somebody that had so much influence that you could feel it? Let me give you a small example. If all of a sudden the president walked in this room, you know it. You may disagree with a lot of things. But I guarantee there's going to be an influence there that you'll recognize that somebody is here of this world's importance. But my friend, how much more should we recognize the presence of God when we come to church? When you come to church on Sunday mornings, it should not be your leftovers from the rest of the week. When you come to church on Sunday mornings, it shouldn't be just a lax and duty mindset that if God has His way in the service or if God doesn't have His way, that's fine. That should never be in the mindset of the believer. In Scripture, we understand that worship is coming underneath God's presence to the place that you're looking up to heaven and you are recognizing He is a superior being. I mean, your mind isn't on the color of the carpet. Your mind isn't on the chandeliers. Your mind isn't on the genre of music. Your mind is on one thing, and that is God Almighty. My friend, if we could just get out of the man-made mentality sometimes, I believe we'd see more accomplished within the Pentecostal ranks. Sometimes, if it isn't the way that we like it, we're not going to worship. Sometimes, my friend, if it is the exact style that we want, we will not worship God. And you're wrong in that. My friend, I've been in Africa before where they had a five-gallon bucket and a stick. And guess what? I've learned to worship God there. I've been in churches where it's been dry as cracker juice. And the music was dead as the doorknob. And the honest, they couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. And they dropped the bucket trying to carry it. I mean, couldn't sing with the lick. But I watched people worship God. That's what it's about, friends. It's not about anything else, but it's about you getting focused. Focus. You get your mind on heaven. You look into Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith, and say, you are worthy, Lord, of all my attention. You are worthy of all my adoration. That's what worship is. Come on now. Either you can take a spoon and put it in your mouth or take a shovel and throw it behind you. Amen. Whatever it's for. You've got to understand, that's what worship is. It's noticing who God is and recognizing that. Now follow me. In Scripture, the word is used to refer to homage even given to idols. You worship something. Come on. You may worship the plate. I don't know. You may worship a job. I don't know. You may worship a family member. I don't know. You may worship a mentality. I don't know what it is. But everybody, you are built and designed from the Garden of Eden to worship something in some form. You hear me today, my friend? That word in the Bible is even used giving homage to idols, material things. But my friend, it should be preserved for the one and true God. So follow me today. So the word itself is not a holy word. People worship all the time. You know, I've been in some movements where they almost idolize the word worship. It's just a word. But it's got to be an action in your life. You can't just have the verbiage of Pentecost and say you're Pentecostal. You cannot just have the verbiage of a Christian and the lingo of a Christian and say that you are a Christian. There has to be action that is given to this, my friend. Help me here today and understand this. The common New Testament word for worship in the Bible, it actually means this in definition. To kiss towards, to kiss the hand, to bow down, to prostrate oneself. The idea of worship is that one prostrates himself before a superior being with a sense of respect all reverence, honor, and homage. That is what it means. And in the Christian context, it is the mindset that when we come into the house of God, that you're bowing down your heart. You're bowing down your mind. You're bowing down everything about you before God Almighty. I mean, you're laying down your job in front of Him. You're laying down your yesterdays in front of Him. You're laying down your sins in front of Him. You're laying down your laziness in front of Him. You're laying down your boredom. I mean, you're laying it all down. You're prostrating yourself. You're saying, God, I've got nothing, no reservations. I've got nothing to hide from you. My hands are empty. My heart is, my mind is made up and my heart is cleansed to this one aspect that is true, that you are the God Almighty and I am a creation, that you spoke the world into existence and I'm living on the footstool, that you are above me and I am below you. That is what worship is, is recognizing that He is above us and is paying Him honor. I've watched people in Pentecost worship preachers more than they do God. Amen. Anybody says, Brother Derek, good job. I said, I'm glad God helped me because I was nervous before I got there. But the anointing falls on you and you tell that God gives you boldness. I've been in movements where they worship a man that has been dead 40 years. And the Holy Ghost couldn't speak to them, Brother Glenn, if they were sitting at tea with them. 
Come on now. I found something in the Bible one time, went to a certain movement, looked in the Scripture. I said, they, that ain't even biblical, what they got in their, in their bylaws there. And, and we were talking about it. I said, you know, to be honest with you, that was misquoted. Well, my grandfather said it was right, and I don't care what the Bible says, basically is what they're saying. Come on now. They worship men over the Word. They worship ideologies over the God of heaven. That what worship is, my friend, is this abandonment. It's no reservation falling at the feet of God and giving Him the honor and respect, my friend. The sermon and the music are just the stimuli that create the desire of hearts to honor Him, my friend. That's why I'm so adamant about singing and preaching in the right atmosphere and the right mindset. We should be giving God leftovers or partial activity. But we shouldn't give the world our best efforts and give God our pennies. We should not give God our efforts and come to church and give God our left. That should never be. Everything from the opening prayer to the closing prayer ought to be directed to worshiping God. From the very songs that are picked out to the message that is preached ought to be about worshiping God. For when you open your eyes on Sunday morning and get your church clothes on, it should be about worshiping God. I'm telling you, friend, we must learn to worship Him and give Him the homage and the respect that He's due. That is the truth. And that's from the pulpit to the pew. Now, as we look at this event, essentially, then worship is this. It is giving. <laughs> Follow me. I, you know, I, I'm raised Pentecostal. <laughs> I was birthed. You ever heard the saying, cut my teeth on the back of pews? I remember seeing mama and granddaddy and all, et cetera, shouting in sawdust camp meetings. I was raised in it. I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been to camp meetings ever since I was a little boy. My friend, I have heard the verbiage in you over the years that I'm not always the biggest fan of. And I hear people say this. I can't wait to go to the house of God and get something. And that's fine. Because believe me, you need something every service. If you realize it or not, if you get to the place you don't feel like you need nothing, just maybe move aside. Maybe I'll get a double portion. Amen. And you always need something from God every single service. You may say, well, I've no, you don't have it figured out. You need something from God. But this is the point today. When I go to church, it's more, of, it's more than just getting. It is giving. And my friend, that's what worship is. Worship's not receiving. Worship is giving. Follow me. I come to church, I give God my worship. And I say, God, Lord, look, Lord, and I need your touch. You know, but I love you and I know you're able to do so. And you know what happens while I'm worshiping Him and giving Him praise? I feel a touch in my life. Hey, man, I call it welfare Christianity. We always want something free from God. Come on. We often say things that in Pentecost that I don't even understand sometimes. I heard one movement was, was starting a movement called Getting High on Jesus Movement, where they always said they felt like they'd get a buzz when they come. I said, my Lord of heaven, I ain't never left church like that. I left church transformed. I left God. I, mean, I left church changed and touched. And yes, I may have felt like I was on cloud nine, but it wasn't because anything I'd done, but it's because I began to worship Him and I got into His presence. That is what worship is, my friend. We must get those mentalities right. We in our movements. So worship is an individual responsibility and the ministers of the church are only there to encourage you in this. Nobody can worship God for you. Nobody. I, 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 we often are challenged because we've all been at places at times where we hadn't worshipped God like we should. You ever been there? You say, well, I, hadn't. Well, I have. I'm glad, you know, I'll be honest with you. Right transparent, see through me. There have been a few times I knew I was saved, born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and, you know, I hadn't done nothing wrong. But I went to church and I was too tired. That's what I would say. Work has got me this week and I'm just, huh. But you know, worship is not always a feeling, it is a decision. Come on. Worship's not always a feeling, it's a decision. I wish people make their minds up and decide to worship God, and then it becomes a feeling. Now, I know sometimes it seems like it's just as easy. I mean, it's just to there. God's a meeting you and God's filling you and God's touching you and God's strengthening you. You know, but sometimes you go to church and you may say, you know, it's been a little lot on my mind here recently and I don't really feel like worshiping God. And that's when you should say, you know what? Hallelujah anyhow. That's when you should say, you know what, God, I'm going to worship you anyhow. It's not about the way that I feel, but it's about what I know is truth. That's what faith is. Faith isn't the feeling. Faith is a decision. You've got to make an action. You've got to make a proclamation in your heart that I'm going to worship God. Even when I don't feel like it, I'm going to get my mind on Him. So my friend, hear me today. So if you attend church just for what you can get, you're wrong. Yes. And that's usually when you find people searching all throughout. Because they ain't willing to give anything, but they always want to receive. 
My, my wife, uh, my wife's Aryan, and I love them. I know they listen to me on CD. Not so. If you're listening on CD in the future, I'm sorry. I'm not talking to you directly. <laughs> but I've been in that area before. I went to one church, and on the front pew was an individual. I said, "How you doing? I ain't seen you a while." He said, "Doing good." I said, "God bless you." I went to another church a month later, preaching somewhere else. He was on that front pew. I said, "How you doing? God bless you." I said, "Doing good." Went to a third church and finally seen him again. I said, "Hey, how you doing?" He said, oh, "I'm going here now." So what are you doing? He said, I'm searching, trying to, trying to get something from the Lord. I thought to myself, my friend, you can get in a prayer closet and find it. Amen. Get you in a good old hole in this Pentecostal church and worship God and change the atmosphere. It isn't about this or that. It's about worshiping God to His full potential. Now hear me today. Worship is depicted in the Bible in so many different avenues and different ways. And let me illustrate the idea of worship. Number one, my first illustration today is this. The fragrance of the tabernacle's incense in the Old Testament. You'll find this in the book of Exodus 30, chapter 30, verses 34 to 38. It provides a very graphic illustration of worship. God gave many instructions regarding how worship was to be carried out in that temple. But one of His visual aids is is described to us here where it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto these sweet spices, and He named of these sweet spices with pure pure frankincense, of each shall be in light weight. And He says this, And thou shalt beat some of them in very small and put them before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee it shall be most holy unto me. So notice this. Now this perfume that was made in the Old Testament, it was a sweet-smelling incense, was to be used only in the tabernacle for worship. Every time they burned it, it was to be worship unto God. Follow me. You, you ever heard of a, um, you know, we have fragrances, colognes, and perfumes. Isn't that stuff expensive? It is aggravating. If you buy anything, I'm saying, man, I can't believe that stuff is $70 for, for a liquid. And I'm just not a big brute fan myself. Amen. Men know what I'm talking about. But here it is, my friend, and it's all right if you like brute. But listen, I remember one time I sat there and I, and I looked and all of a sudden all the, all the colognes that smelled good had a picture of somebody on the box. A celebrity or somebody. I, I don't know who they were. And I don't support the celebrities, but if, if it's affordable... I'm going to buy, the, buy a cologne and I wear it there. And I thought to myself, isn't it amazing they're going to tie all these fragrances to somebody? Because I'm sure all of them don't smell like this. That's in my mind, just the way I think. But do you know there's a perfume and a fragrance in the Bible that if it was to be bottled up, God's picture would be put on it? And I have a good feeling it smelled pretty good. And you can't afford it. I have a feeling that this fragrance that was mentioned in Scripture, and it says that he would, they would make it. My friend, I, the point is this. The fragrance was designed for God, by God, and only for God. Nobody else was this fragrance to be used for. Now hear me today, my friend. It was a recipe for a perfume in the Bible. And as it would be burned, now follow me, this perfume was such a sweet-smelling incense, and it was only to be used in the tabernacle. Why? Because it was to be holy, holy, holy. How many knows our worship is to be holy worship. What's your mentality this morning? Follow me. Is the mentality that you had this morning the same mentality that you had at work on Friday? <laughs> Follow me. Is it different? It should be. I hope, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Our mindset, everything we do, you know, sometimes we're, tr- we're going to work or whatever your daily duties are in life. Everybody's got different walks of life. My friend, when you go to church on Sunday, there ought to be, a, be something that you have saved up for the house of God that you haven't given anybody else all week. There ought to be something saved up inside of your heart that you hadn't even given anybody, no, not a spouse, nobody, but you've got it preserved in your heart. Guess what? You don't worship your spouse as the Creator, do you? You better not. You don't worship anything else. There ought to be a reservation in your spirit that when you come to the house of God, that it's a fragrance that's within your heart, that the only place that you take the lid off is in the house of God. I mean, it's the only place you take the cap off and you say, Lord, I couldn't wait to get here all week. Lord, I couldn't wait to get in your presence. Lord, I couldn't wait to stand before your throne. Lord, I couldn't wait to sing a song. Lord, I couldn't wait to hear a message. Lord, I couldn't wait to get to Sunday school. And there you've got this reserved worship for God that you've been saving up all week for Him. That's the way it should be every single service. Now, I'm going somewhere. Hear me. And don't fall off the boat yet. Stay with me. We'll make it to shore. 
Hear me, I want you to follow me. So, what does, what did, this morning, let me ask you this question, what did God smell from you this morning? Did you give Him the best out of your heart? Did you? Or not? Did you give Him the best? Or was it, was it something unique? Or was it just a, a flawed mentality? My friend, the Bible talks about in the book of Isaiah, when worship stinks. <laughs> This is what it says in Isaiah one thirteen. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. He's pretty much saying, "Ugh, quit doing it." I dare say there's a lot going on in the church world. God's just saying that's horrible. It's a foul smell, and I don't accept it. Hear me. That's what God's looking for, true worshipers. So let me follow me here just for another moment as we go into another example. We, we go into the New Testament, John chapter 12, and we come to this, we come to this story about after John chapter 11 is when Lazarus was raised from the dead. But then we come into the story where here it is, Jesus is in a house here, and I'm going to explain something to you that makes sense. As the fragrance of the incense of the tabernacle rose up to the nostrils of God, it signified worship. But there's another fragrance in John chapter 12. We know that Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, where we had been dead and raised from the dead. And there they made unto him a supper and Martha served. And Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spignard, very costly, and some say maybe a year's wages, and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of that ointment. This is another picture in the New Testament of what worship really is. My friend, Mary used that which was glow with precious to her. She was somebody that came into a room and absolutely changed the atmosphere. We're, we're usually succumb to our atmospheres. You don't think so. If everybody else is quiet, you'll be quiet. So it, it, you do it. Everybody else says something, you might say something. Everybody else worship God, maybe you worship God. We're very conformist in our, and even you just say, well, I don't conform to the world, but you conform to your neighbor. It's just as bad. Maybe not sinful, but it may make you lukewarm. Come on. Conformist is this, is that you give in to the atmosphere, and I would ask you a question today. Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? You know what a thermometer does? It just conforms to the atmosphere. But I guarantee I get over to this thermostat over here, bump her up on 90 degrees and turn the heat on. It wouldn't be too long. Somebody's going to say, it's hot in here. Some longer than others. I know that. Because what it is, a, a thermostat has the ability with technology tied to another unit that it can change the atmosphere. So this would be my question to you today. Are you a believer that comes to church and you are you, 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 you conform to that which is around you? Or are you somebody that comes to church and you change the atmosphere when you come into the house of God? Let me put it this way. Could anybody tell you were missing if you wasn't here? Other than just your attendance? <laughs> I've been in churches before when somebody was not there. Not only did I miss them, but I missed their worship. I can tell when Brother Neff's not here. I can. I miss them. I miss all of us. But I can tell you one thing. When Brother Neff's not here, I can tell. I said, man, I wish Brother Neff was here. That amen helps. It's just you can tell when somebody's not there. But this is the question you must understand. Do you Are you somebody that God can tell that when you're in a room that you change the atmosphere? Notice what Mary did here. First she used that which was glory to her. The Bible says she did what? She let down her hair. Her hair was long enough where she washed the feet of Jesus here. She, she took her hair, and the Bible says that a woman's hair is a glory unto her. That's what the Bible says. Argue with Scripture on that. That's a fact. To wash the dusty, dirty feet of Jesus. And she didn't use water. She used a costly, fragrant ointment in the Bible. She said that she used spignard, and that is the essence of worship. Here it is, my friend. She self-humiliated herself by all the ground, hair down. That's the woman's glory in the Bible. Her long hair's a glory unto her. And she's got her feet, washing her feet with the fragrance. And here she is my friend completely sitting in front of all these people and she could have cared less what any of them thought she didn't say well I might mess my hair up she messed it up she didn't sit there and say oh my precious little bottle of ointment mama gave it to me she's gone for three years here it is my only you know what she did break it 
<laughs> she didn't worry about it. She said, that even though this is something that is precious to me, I'm letting down my hair. Here it is. You think Jesus' feet were probably dirty? You walk sandal-footed all the time and see what happens to your feet. My feet look rough and they're in shoes all the time. Most of the time. <laughs> I know that this man walking around Jesus with dirty feet. But for here it is. She took this precious ointment and that is the essence of worship. It is it's a place that you don't worry about the value of what's in your hands or what you're about to give to God. But I'm going to ask us a question today. Are you a Mary, a Martha, or a Judas within this church? You're one of the three. Follow me. The characters in the setting shows us three different mentalities that still exist today. And I've preached to them all over America. You won't ever believe that I've met a bunch of Judases, but I have. And they act friendly. But they're pretty mean once you get to know them. So here it is. We know the story that Mary and Martha, guess what they were? We know they were sisters. They were different. Martha was always serving and Mary was always sitting at the feet of Jesus. In fact, Jesus had previously said that Mary chose that which was better than all of Martha's service. And notice this. Here it is Martha. And the Bible says she was cumbered about. Now here it is. She's a busy person, isn't she? I mean, she's over here. She's over there. She's over here. I mean, she's in here. She's in the kitchen. She's in the living room. She's in the bedroom. She's washing the linens. I mean, she's changing the light bulb. Look at the dust over there. Look at this. Here it is, my friend. She seemed to be so pragmatic. And my friend, many of us in the church world, we tend to be so pragmatic too, don't we? Come on. We have a generation of Marthas. That doesn't mean you're a bad person, but it just means you're always busy. Always busy. Here it is, Martha, somebody that, you know, she would be the type that would have the church so fine-tuned to a system with all this programs and activities. But yet, my friend, we are very careful not to waste our substance because it's so precious and we've got to be careful. But here it is, that's what Martha was. She was a pragmatic woman. So much so that even when, she gave, even when we give to God, sometimes some people tend to mark things out very carefully. Sometimes God will have you give when it hurts. Amen. I'm sure you've given when it hurts. And it's easy to give if you've got a thousand, you know, five thousand dollars in your pocket and you know, God says give a thousand. I'll give a thousand, Lord, sure. What if God says give the five? Think about it. I've been to places where I felt led and put the twenty in the offering plate, Derek. I'm like, oh Lord. I do it. Not because I'm begrudging, because I don't understand at that moment. But God show me something later. So here it is, my friend. She's not the type. Martha is not the type that would take that bottle of spikenard and would she, she would not, she would not pour a whole year's wages and stoop to the humility to wipe Jesus' feet. She's the type that says, look, if I do 10% now, maybe I can give him 20% later. That's Martha. I don't know if it was their mother's box. Maybe Martha told Mary, what are you doing with mama's box? A perfume. We don't know. But we do know that she's very proud. And here it is, my friend. Notice this. Then we have Judas. Judas is the one that snarls at everybody else worshiping and thinks that it's just too much. Basically, Jesus is not worth that much to Judas. You ever seen somebody see, see somebody else worshiping and say, that's just unnecessary? Then they wonder why they never receive or progress spiritually. More than not, spiritually. He's that type of person that says this. Hey, what I would tell Judas is this. Judas, it's not waste, it's worship. What Mary did is not waste. It's worship. I'll tell you this. Anything you do to the extreme for the glory of God, it's not waste, it's worship. I'd also look at Judas and say this. Judas, worship is better than welfare. That's biblical. Now follow me just for another moment. You had this woman by the name of Mary. Mary's act was an act of worship as the fragrance rose from the ointment. It betrayed the essence of worship from her heart. And that is what God is after. She was a true worshiper. And my friend, this is what we have to understand. You've got Martha who represents religious activity. You've got Judas underneath the guise of welfare. And you've got Mary that's a worshiper. And God says this, all of these are important, but hear me. Worship is more important than all three of those. I mean, than the other two. Yes, it's good to do religious activity. Yes, it's good to give to the poor. But if you do not worship, you are going to be an incomplete believer. You're not going to be joyous. You're not going to have the peace. You're not going to be contagious spiritually. You've got to make sure you are a worshiper. Are 
you a worshiper? Is my question. Here Mary, Mary is. She doesn't care about anything else but giving God the glory. So understand this. We must follow this for a few moments. I'll skip over a lot of things just to get to the point. I don't have, I've got more preaching. You've got time this morning. Romans 12, Romans chapter 12 in the Bible gives us a very unique perspective. You would understand that in the book of Romans, in the first 11 chapters, Paul talks about the marvelous gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about his redemptive purposes and plans for the world. He talks about his mercy for sinful man. He talks about the love of God and the spirit of God in Romans chapter 8. He goes through for the first 11 chapters and he describes the glory of God and the power of salvation to us. Then he comes to Romans chapter 12 and says this, I beseech you therefore, everybody follow me, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And guess what that word service is translated? Worship. He's letting us know, hear me today. He said, I beseech you, follow me as an individual. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It is your reasonable worship. Most likely, we look at worship sometimes. You want to tell you when the greatest day of worship was? It was Calvary. See Jesus nailed to the cross. Nails in his hands, nail in his feet, blood pouring down his body, crown of thorns on his head, stripped naked in front of society, carrying a cross, whipped at the whipping post, and the whole time God is, oh, that's my son doing my will. The world looks at it and says, failure and waste. God the Father looks at it and says, that's not waste, that's worship. I feel the Holy Ghost here to help you. My friends, every time you tell somebody lost about Jesus, you tell yourself no. You tell God yes. God says, oh, praise God. That's my son. That's my daughter right there. When you fall on your knees at the job and you're just overwhelmed by what's going on, and you're on your knees and you're saying, God, I need strength. I can't do it without you. God goes, that's my son and daughter right there. They're worshiping me today. Every time, my friend, you have a family situation and, and the natural man says, won't you rise up and defend yourself? And you say, no, I'm going to pray for my enemies. God says, that's worship right there. It's worship. And when you come to the house of God, you enter into His presence. And you say, God, I could be doing other things today. I could go to the ball field today. I could stay at home and watch the football game. I hope you wouldn't ever choose a football game over Jesus. I could be doing all this today, but you say, you know what, Lord? I'm going to go to church. I'm going to learn of God. God looks at you and says, that's my children. Let them worship me. And then when we find me today, when you come together collectively, I won't be much longer. The Bible lets us know this, but the hour cometh and now is, back to my, my text, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, there's two ways you can view this, and I won't be much longer. When the Bible says we worship God in spirit, we are tripartite where your body, soul, and spirit. That means the innermost man. But I like to look at it from this perspective where it says the next verse, God is a spirit. You me tell you how you worship God? It's when the Spirit of God comes into your life, revives your spirit. He makes you a worshiper. Now, if you got saved and you say, I've never felt like worshiping God, then I don't know if you got saved, to be honest. I think that sounds critical. When I come up from praying and weeping and gotten born again and forgiven, I got up and said, I, I, God's good. Amen. If you got up and said, there won't much to it, I say, oh, you never got born again. Worship is that real. Worship, worship is that authentic. The Bible says the Father is seeking worshipers. You know what God's looking for in abundant life this morning? He's looking for worshipers. And my question would be to you today, do you worship God? My last question would be this. Will you worship God? When you leave here today, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you going to worship God or not? It's a question. My wife goes to the piano. During this altar call today, and we're going to make a, we won't be, just a very simple altar call. Worship is a deep reverence and a love for Him. It is simply kissing towards heaven, as the New Testament would describe. And how many would come and not ask God for anything today is my question. Sometimes we're asking God for so many things that sometimes God's saying, look, I'm available to you, but don't ask me for nothing. 
But all you do when you worship God, you tell God, thank you. You're worthy. You're holy. You're true. You're faithful. You're everything. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the truth, the life, the Word, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I mean, you're, you're everything. You're the rock in the wilderness. You're the seed in the book of Genesis. When you look at the Bible, I see Him everywhere and it causes me to do what? Worship His holy name. But the hour cometh, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. In this New Testament dispensation, if you do not worship God, something is wrong with you. Now, we could argue all day about the expression of worship. Some's quiet and some's loud. I don't care how you do it. Do it. In truth and in spirit. Just do it. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's what you've got to understand. Now, notice this. The hour cometh and now is. It's right now. If you say, oh, Brother Derek, that ain't for me. I'm, I'm, I'm say, no, it's for you. Like I said, throw the shovel down, pick up the spoon and swallow. It'll help you. It's for you. It's for me. Let me tell you why people get bored and usually backslide on God. is because they never learn to worship. And so they sit there and think God is just some sort of, some sort of system of res- receiving all the time. Bad day, God give me. Good day, now God give me. Go to church now, God give me. Give me, give me. God's not Santa Claus, friends. Quit waiting for Him to pop down your little chimney and, and give you all the good gifts. Worship Him and the gifts will come. I've watched people struggle for years trying to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They say, Brother Derek, how you do it? I say, you hunger, you thirst, and you worship. You do that, you'll get it. You hunger, you thirst, you worship, you'll get it. When you get saved, worship God. Stand to your feet all over the building. I just feel in my spirit, amen. I, I've got to obey the Holy Ghost regardless of what any, anybody else feels or does. I love being stirred by the Spirit of God. And I know God's laid this on my heart. I'll be honest with you, two months ago, I had this message outlined in my spirit two months ago. And I spent three, probably seven or eight hours putting this together. I didn't get to go over all of it, maybe another time. And I sat there and then God didn't let me preach. It didn't let me preach. I prayed the other day. God said, preach to him about worship. And God told me to give a message to you as a church. He's seeking for true worshipers.